This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. So uh, you can be assured that in addition to a uh, long discussion on Trump's tweets, tonight's uh, Dem Socialist debate due, uh, you're going to get a conversation about a range of other issues, uh, the reinstatement of the death penalty and the recasting by Joe Biden of his position on that issue. Uh, Anyone going to ask him about the heavy petting? And uh, why you're making out with your granddaughter? Perha- I mean, I'm perhaps sorry. that will come up, or perhaps they'll just maybe they'll just have him a little bit further away from everybody else on the stage. Then uh, you have a little additional separation for Joe. The other thing, of course, will be the end of the world in 12 years, um, or uh, the uh, end of the world spice and her band members still promoting that in some form or fashion. Even though I guess now her position is. 12 years was intended to be directionally correct, not specifically correct, because we know her position is that if you're morally right, you don't need to be particularly correct on the facts. So that's helpful. And she's scaring children with that kind of rhetoric. A person in the position of power like that should not be irresponsible and say things. Yeah. Um, Math doesn't lie. And the children are scaring us like these climate change activists who super glued themselves to the doors of the U.S. Capitol building what? last week. This is one of their protests. It's going to hurt when they, you know. They, uh, Extinction Rebellion off. is the name of the group. Extinction Rebellion chanting climate exclamation point, extinction exclamation point, rebellion exclamation point. Not very creative, and it doesn't rhyme, but uh, I hope they had enough nail polish to uh, remove themselves from where they were affixed at the Capitol building. If we could try to be uh, uh, factually correct, and uh, then we, I guess we can get to the morality of respective policy positions, I think that's a good way to sort of reverse engineer what you're going to hear from Democrats tonight. And to help us do that, we're pleased to be joined again by Bjorn Lumberg, he's the director of the Copenhagen Consensus Center think tank, and he's also the author of Cool It and Skeptical Environmentalism. Bjorn, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Dan, it's good to be back. Uh, and uh, you have written a piece uh, recently uh, for The Telegraph about uh, sort of w- how voters are reacting to some of these apocalyptic pronouncements from the, uh, the, the, you know, the most popular the most followed uh, alarmists, uh, AOC, but not limited to America. They're just sort of everywhere you go, they seem to be rejecting the proposals to deindustrialize their economies to save the planet, according to the climate alarmists. And, and you sort of catalog some of that. Yeah, that's exactly right, Dan, because fundamentally, uh, if you ask people, are you worried about global warming? Yes, they have heard about this, and yes, they are worried. Uh, so, Amy, you're absolutely right. You know, the scaring does seem to work. But then if you ask them, how much are you willing to pay? It turns out not very much. And, of course, it's this crucial bit that I think a lot of the climate alarmists are just simply forgetting that most people are just not willing to pay very much. Uh, 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 a recent uh, uh, survey in the U.S. Uh, asked Americans, you know, do you want us to do aggressive action, as they called it? And two-thirds said yes. But then you ask them how much you're willing to pay, and two-thirds didn't even want to pay $100 a year to fix that problem. So, you know, the, the simple point here is to realize that while there's a lot of rhetoric out there, there's a very little room to actually maneuver to find smart climate policies. And that's why we've got to stop with these. We're going to change our whole society in, in, uh, in, a, uh, in two seconds, and we're just going to allow the cost to uh, uh, ramp up. We need to find a cheap and effective way that can actually fix climate change, but still not cost very much. Well, what are some of your, some of your ideas? Well, look, right now, most people want to switch to renewables because it feels really nice. Uh, but it's mostly rhetoric right now. Uh, renewables actually, so solar and wind, contribute about 1% of global energy. So it's nowhere near having the impact that most people are 
certainly believing that it will have. Uh, the International Energy Agency estimates even in 2040, if everyone does everything they promised in the Paris Agreement and so on, we'll probably get a little more than 4% of our energy from solar and wind. And so what you need to focus on is if you want to get a much bigger pickup, you need to make solar and wind and all the other green energy sources, that includes nuclear, to be much cheaper. Because unless it's cheap, essentially cheaper than fossil fuels, you will never get the majority of humanity to switch mostly to green energy sources. Well, it is, I mean, and some of that, too, is just... Um... I mean, it's just, it, it, you know, it's it's just ha- magical thinking with respect to. And Bill Gates has made this point. Other people have made this point. Do you know how windmills are built? Do you, do you know what they're built with? Uh, do you know the the uh, the 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 requirements uh, in terms of use of fossil fuels to construct these things to have backup generators? I mean, there's just like no interest in the specifics of how you actually do energy production for all of these people that are. Uh, suggesting that uh, we uh, you know, walk away from fossil fuels tomorrow. No, it's very much virtual signal, uh, virtue signaling uh, for a lot of people. It makes you feel good. Uh, but the reality, of course, is uh, unless we have massive storage, you just can't allow yourself to be dependent on only having energy when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. Uh, and, and so the reality here is that wind and solar can be a nice supplement at some points, especially if you live uh, close to a lot of hydropower. But otherwise, you really have to find much better alternatives. And that includes investing a lot more in research and development. Uh, you know, look, if, if you look back at all the other problems we've faced in the world, we didn't solve them by saying to everyone, I'm sorry, could you live a little dimmer? Could you live a little poorer? Could you live a little less? You've solved it through technology. So when we worried about the, the world not having enough food back in the 60s, and 1960s and 70s, uh, you know, the, the solution wasn't what your mom told you, you know, eat up your uh, plate or otherwise the, uh, the, the black guys in, in, in Africa uh, uh, won't get enough food. The solution, of course, was the Green Revolution that we actually managed to get technology to Africa and Asia to allow them to produce much more food. And the same thing is going to be the solution for green energy. If we get technology to be cheap enough, we can solve this problem, but we can't solve it just on magical thinking and feeling good. Well, the other uh, problem that uh, the AOCs of the world have is um, uh, China and a lot of other countries that are substantial emitters, China being number one in the world now, um, they're not on board. They're building thousands of coal plants. They are not on board with you. So if this is about saving the world, you're not getting buy-in. I don't care how many signatories are on how many protocols. Exactly. I mean, first of all, China is uh, is promising very little uh, by 2030, and there is virtually no reason to believe that they would be punished in any way if they don't live up to this. Of course, India uh, using much less fossil fuels, want to use a lot more simply because it's the way that you pull people out of poverty. Much of Africa is going to pay hugely for the promises they they made, and they're incredibly poor. Of course, they're not actually going to allow themselves to go down this route. So what we need to recognize is you're only going to get a few rich, well-meaning countries to make these promises, but they're probably not even going to go through with them. I, I think it's very instructive that if you look at New Zealand, uh, who just uh, became the first nation to actually promise to go carbon neutral uh, by 2050, uh, which is pretty far ahead depending, uh, compared to what these uh, extinct, uh, extinction rebellion people are, are asking for. Uh, but they actually had the uh, audacity to at least ask their economists, how much is this going to cost us? And the answer was by 2050, the average cost will be 16% of GDP. Wow. That's a huge cost. That's the equivalent to all the state budget in New Zealand right now. Uh, so, you know, that's and that's a, and that's a country uh, with more hospitals than everything else. And that's a country with more sheep than people. Um, so, yeah, that's <laughs> that's 60 percent of GDP is pretty substantial. That's the size of the uh, health care. One six. Yeah, one six. One Sixteen. Six. That's yeah. that's that's yeah. approximately the size of the health care sector in this country. That's a big number. It, it is a huge number. And, 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 and again, what you have to recognize is most countries actually going to be, uh, uh, most, most countries' governments are going to be deselected if they keep on these processes. That's what we've seen in a lot of places. 
uh, around the world, that people just simply will not have that happen. Most famously, of course, in France, uh, when they tried to put uh, what's equivalent to about uh, uh, 12 cents increase yeah. per, per gallon of or gasoline. Yellow and they vest. Said no, and they've yeah. had protests ever since. Mm-hmm. Well, what about Australia? You, you mentioned in your article that that was the climate change election. Well, so, you know, uh, a lot of people are saying people in elections are actually going to vote for green parties and vote for a new green revolution. Well, the, the evidence seems to be the exact opposite. Australia's election was billed as the climate change election, and everybody expected the uh, Labour Party to basically cruise to an easy win. But that didn't happen. And why? Well, because Labour had actually promised a lot of policies that most people could see, oh, this is actually going to cost me, both in terms of uh, more, more dear uh, electricity costs, but it's probably also going to cost the economy and uh, reduce jobs. And so people actually voted for the sitting government exactly because they did not want very expensive climate policies. And, and we've seen this around the, you know, around the world. We've also seen this in, in, uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, Colorado has rejected the effort to limit oil drilling. Uh, uh, Washington, the uh, uh, Democrat or uh, uh, Washington, actually rejected to become the first state to have a carbon tax. And we've seen several uh, 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 defeats for, for, for trying to do a, a carbon tax. So, again, what we're seeing across the world is a lot of countries saying, you know what, we'd like to do a little bit, but not very much. And that's, of course, where the Extinction Rebellion and all the other guys that are arguing for more uh, climate measures are, are failing uh, to realize that most people care about the environment. They want to do something for climate, but only a little bit. But, right. You know, right. Well, hundred dollars or less. Right. Well, well most people um, aren't as cavalier with their quality of life as Tom Steyer is with their quality of life. So it's very easy for the uber wealthy, the champagne socialists to be very cavalier about the quality of life and the expense of uh, power uh, to power that life for people that are middle income or lower income. But it turns out, you know, they're willing to pitch in, but they're not willing to be pitched out. And that's, that's these draconian policies that are being proposed. It's, it's easy to understand why people are rejecting them. I know that's a political statement and that's really not your bailiwick but but i mean it seems pretty apparent including with some of the elections that you've described in your piece exactly and that's why we need to recognize we're not going to solve global warming by either you know uh, uh, ignoring it but we're not going to solve it by claiming we need to do everything and you know throw the aoc kind of trillions of dollars after this every year because people are not going to accept that they're going to accept cheap, effective solutions. And that's why we should be focusing on investing in research and development, because if we can get the technology to be there, if we can innovate the price of green energy down below fossil fuels, then of course, everyone will switch, not just in America, but also in China and India. But if we don't focus on making market forces work for us, that is making innovation yeah. make this cheaper, will not solve this. You've got to make a better mousetrap, precisely. Bjorn Lumberg, director of the Copenhagen Consensus Center, think tank. He's also the author of Cool It and Skeptical Environmentalist. And uh, I will uh, tweet out at Dan Proptis column, voters don't want the green campaigners' extreme policies, uh, extreme climate policies that was in the Telegraph. Uh, Bjorn, thanks so much for joining us again. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Take care. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. It's what Chicago is talking about. It's Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan and Amy on AM560. 